Well, certainly has been a bit of a roller coaster of quality so far, hasn't it? Let's stop over in issue 4 and see if the quality can keep climbing up. Issue 4's cover is awesome. I'm not kidding, I absolutely love this cover, and it's specifically for the joke. The scene itself is cute enough, with Sonic acting as Royal Chimney Sweep for no adequately explained reason, but it's the tagline at the top that sells it. The darker and grittier Sonic the Hedgehog. For those of you who know comic book history, you're well aware that the early 90s were well within the dark age of comics, and are probably laughing your ass off right now. We open the comic proper to part one of our first story, The Lizard of Odd. Jumping the gun a bit, the story title really doesn't have much to do with the story proper, apart from the fact that it has a lizard in it, so the reference is almost entirely pointless. Anyway, we see Robotnik proclaiming that whatever the next creature is that his bots bring back for roboticization, that one shall be made into the ultimate killer robot. And wouldn't you know it, the bots are just arriving with a great big cage. Robotnik excitedly speculates on what sort of animal they've captured. An elephant? A rhino? Nope, they caught a salamander! You know, it's kind of impressive that Robotnik actually rules the world at this point in time, given how inept he's built his help. Well, that and his willingness to destroy those that fail him after a single mistake, as he orders the unfortunate robots to march themselves into the slag shop while he marches off to try and salvage the situation with the little salamander. Robotnik drops the little thing into the roboticizer, ordering his buzz bomber to start the process before also demanding that the AC be turned up. Once again, his robots go out of their way to prove their ineptitude when Buzz Bomber just can't tell which button or lever to toy with to follow his master's orders. So he just flips one. No, you bumbling bee! That's the size control knob! The robot will grow out of control! Um, why do you have something like that on the machine? I mean, if you have a machine that creates robots, why would you have an option on it to make the robot beyond your control? Well, predictably, the machine ends up overloading, and the result is a massive lizard robot calling itself Universe Salamander. Well, I feel as though I should be making a joke about that name, but nothing comes to mind, really. It takes this opportunity to state that this world shall soon belong to it, and then we cut to a fourth wall joke with Sonic and friends. They're observing Universe Salamander on their plot convenience monitor, prompting Sonic to make this statement. Jurassic Park is already out on Sega Genesis. Only $49.99 at your local Kitty City and Toys R Us. Buy it now, suckers! Well, now that we've gotten the obligatory advertisement out of the way, Sonic wastes no time in dashing out to confront the beast, only to see Robotnik flying away in his Eggmobile. And then to tell us that he sees Robotnik flying away in his Eggmobile. Robotnik announces his intention to leave the planet entirely to avoid getting munched on by his own creation, and it's not a moment later that the menace itself appears, making its best grr I'm scary pose. Sonic launches himself right at the beast, and straight into his mouth. Out of every area he could have aimed for, why go straight for the head? Or, more specifically, why go for the mouth full of razor-sharp teeth? My god, the Archie series predicted Sonic's spin attack accuracy 20 years before Sonic Boom! He dodged my spin attack? Nobody's ever done that before. FYI, I still hate that game. Then we get a few panels of Universe Salamander attempting to chew Sonic up, though apparently he's not very good at it, as Sonic looks quite unharmed between those robots' teeth. We get a shot of all his friends making awkward faces, and then we end part one of the story with Universe Salamander walking off and a caption box informing us that Sonic the Hedgehog is... <gasps> gone! Why the unnecessary breath in the sentence? Did the writer just need to breathe while he was writing that and decided to throw it in? Couldn't be for dramatic purposes, a gasp in the middle of a sentence is just... <gasps> awkward! And then we flip the page and we're immediately in part two. Not even an ad between the two parts. Meaning that, once again, splitting the story into two parts is, say it with me everyone, entirely pointless. Anyway, we open the pointless part two on Sonic's grieving friends, lamenting the loss of the hero and wondering what they should do now. But any tension that the situation could hold is instantly dissolved when we see Sonic performing a spin dash inside Universe Salamander's mouth, forcing him to belch Sonic out. But the beast isn't beaten by such a simple trick and attempts to crush Sonic with an uprooted tree. Since the only attack he's attempted on the creature failed, Sonic decides to channel Graham Chapman's King Arthur and run away. Run away! Run away! 
Luckily, off screen, without us seeing it, without it being hinted at at any point, and without him deciding to use it at any point in the past to stop Robotnik, he's managed to gather up 50 power rings and 7 chaos emeralds. And also, luckily, he's hidden them right next to a checkpoint post, meaning that he can very easily enter a special zone. And then the comic completely goes off the rails as Sonic tells us that we can help him out too. All we need to do is go out and buy ourselves a Genesis, a copy of Sonic the Hedgehog 2, and playing it to completion. Well, okay, comic, if you want me to stop reading you and go do other things, I'll happily oblige. Well, that took no time at all. Well, now that Sonic's managed to collect 50 rings in the special zone, he is able to transform himself into Super Sonic, in a panel that looks like it would be really trippy through a kaleidoscope, man. As he exits the special zone, he lists off a few of his abilities in this form, including having permanent super sneakers and invulnerability. And of course, the ability to pass right through enemies without a problem. It almost sounds like he's trying to advertise something from the home shopping network, and next up for sale is this lovely embossed gold-plated Supersonic. It comes with invincibility standard, with your choice of obnoxious sparkles or uncontrollable speed, and could be yours for only three easy payments of $59.99, plus shipping and handling, sorry, no COD. This would make an excellent gift for a friend or a family member, even your wife if you're into that sort of thing, and could be yours just in time for the holidays. Uh, sorry, where was I? Oh, right, comic, yeah. Sonic leaps through Universe Salamander, which for some reason doesn't destroy him, and hightails it back to Knothole, where all his friends are still just watching what's happening on the computer screen and commenting on what's happening rather than, you know, actively contributing to the plot. Sonic zooms in and asks Rotor if he kept the enlarging and shrinking component that they salvaged from the mobile robot maker last issue. W wait what Oh my god, this is actually the first true instance of continuity in the comic. And normally, I could commend a moment like this if it didn't come with so many problems. First off, much like the Chaos Emeralds from a page ago, we were never clued in that they did any sort of salvaging or anything during the last issue. While we're on the subject, here's a question that's been bugging me since this whole thing started. Where exactly is Bunny during all of this? I mean, if you're going to give us a callback to a story that introduced her, you could at least acknowledge that she exists, but no. She's not mentioned anywhere in this story. What makes this even worse is the fact that Bunny would probably have been chomping at the bit to help out with the situation. But we don't get a single reason why she's not here. Did she sleep in? Is she having her legs oiled? Did she just not eat her Wheaties that day? Give me a reason, writers! Okay, I'm sorry, I'm done harping on that issue for now. Let's just move onward, shall we? Sonic takes the MacGuffin device and confronts Universe Salamander again. Rather than treat us to a knockdown drag out fight, Sonic fires a laser at it and shrinks it down to the size of something really small. Man, I am off my game today. Well, not that it matters much. Universe Salamander turns tail and runs away after Sonic threatens to give him a good stomping, and our story ends on a fart joke. Always the best way to go out, don't you all agree? This story is. eh. There are good things about it here and there, and it does contain a few important milestones in the comic's history, such as the first instance of inter-issue continuity, and the first appearance of Super Sonic, but the former creates such a big continuity error that it's a big point of contention, and the latter reads more as an advertisement for the Genesis game than anything else. Actually, combining that with our out-of-nowhere Jurassic Park ad, and the encouraging of kids to play video games, the story reads as a much heavier advertisement of the source material than the other issues up to this point. What's more, while the main villain of the story is made out to be a threat to our heroes, he doesn't really do all that much except talk a big game, and was defeated so fast and so conveniently that there was next to no tension in the story. At least a few of the past stories managed some form of tension. This one, there's just nothing. And then we hit the dregs. We have a one-page comic about Antoine trying to build a vanity mirror, a birthday card encouraging kids to once again destroy their precious comics, a supersonic pinup, and uh, a one-page comic with Al and Cal. And before you say anything, I was still correct when I said they don't appear again in the main story until issue 59. I know what I'm talking about, I swear. 
Oh yeah, and then we get another two one-page comics, and my god, there is a lot of filler in this issue. I mean, there was always some filler in the issues that came before, but this issue is just egregious about it. Anyway, after all of that, we're finally in the next story, Tails' Little Tale. Turns out Sonic's plum tuckered out after the first story, so this one's gonna be all about Tails. Tails wanders off, proclaiming that he will take over, looking after everything while Sonic sleeps, and misses the obvious welcome back party that robots are throwing for Robotnik down at the bottom of the hill. The dictator encourages his army to scatter and catch up on all the looting and burning and pillaging they hadn't been doing during the last story. Burn! Pillage! Terrorize! Jaywalk! The Fiend! Encouraging his army to jaywalk in a forested area where there are no traffic lights or paved roads of any kind. Buzz Bomber and Orbanod immediately spot Tails up on a hill and dash off to attack him, Buzz Bomber snatching him up while Orbanot tosses one of his spiked balls at him. Tails, however, demonstrating a lot more combat prowess than he usually does in spin-off material, manages to deflect the projectile back at Orbanot, taking him down, and then, Sweet Sonic Spinballs, them Tails be deadly! Um, well, after that sudden confidence-boosting burst of adrenaline, Tails feels like he can take on the world, and decides to fly straight into the middle of one of Robotnik's installations and take him down himself. He promptly flies straight into a wall being used for an impromptu shadow puppet show, and gets carted off by two SWAT bots to be roboticized. But wait, what's this? Sonic's here for no reason? The day is saved! The robots are even so intimidated that they don't give Sonic a chance to turn them into scrap metal, instead activating their self-destruct switches. Sonic rushes Tails out, and the explosion caused by the two robots wrecks everything up. And so the story ends with Sonic and Tails walking off while Sonic says that Tails learned a valuable lesson about patience, well, if that's not the pot calling the kettle black, and Tails saying he'll look before he leaps, just as he's about to walk straight into a hole in the ground. This story is actually better than the first one. It's super short and very fast-paced, but it hits all the right notes, and the rushed pacing does not feel nearly as distracting as it did in the first story. It has the added benefit of building off the ending of the last story, with Sonic being tired and Robotnik returning from his 10-second retirement, and it also doesn't try to shove in a bunch of unnecessary characters, instead focusing on just Sonic and Tails, which has another added benefit of not creating the plot hole of leaving out a character that really should have been there in the first place. Okay, I'm done. So overall, it could be better. The first story is just... I don't want to say boring, but it straddles the line. The few good things it does are outdone by a few glaring issues that even a gag comic like this should be able to avoid more easily, while the overall amount of Sega advertisements in the story are just really distracting. The second story was good, even if it was a bit short, but it played its simplicity well, and it was a good backup story for what it was. But again, I have to take points off for the excessive amount of needless padding in the issue. Four pages lost to unfunny single-page comics, and two pages of filler designed to get kids to tear apart their comics. Pardon me if I don't approve of such practices. That's six pages that could have been used to flesh out either of the existing stories a bit more. Heck, those six pages could have been their own backup story. It's just disappointing. Actually, disappointing is a good way to sum up this entire issue. Not the worst, I do think it's better than the second issue, our current low point for the series, but the wasted potential and rush stories really drags this one down. Hopefully when we hit issue 5, we'll actually clear the average marker for the series.